My name is Kevin Muehlman, and I'm the External Affairs Associate here at NYU Washington, D.C. On behalf of the John Bradmas Center at New York University, thank you for coming to tonight's event. Tonight marks the first of many summer events in the Young Leaders Network series. By developing the Young Leaders Network, the Bradmas Center seeks to create programs that will enrich the time students spend at their summer internships and in Washington, D.C. We hope events like this will help interns like you build a network of relationships with mentors and peers, and maybe encourage you to return to the nation's capital to start a career in public service after you graduate. Tonight, we are joined by former presidential speechwriters during the George W. Bush and Bill Clinton administrations. John P. McConnell served more than 10 years on the White House staff in two administrations. As a senior speechwriter for President George W. Bush and Vice President Dick Cheney, John was part of the three-person team responsible for all of the president's major addresses. In the Bush-Cheney White House, John held the unique position of both deputy assistant to the president and assistant to the vice president. In his career, he has also worked as a principal speechwriter for Vice President Don Quayle, 1996 uh, presidential nominee Bob Dole, and 2012 Vice Presidential nominee Paul Ryan. June Shi uh, began her career as a cops and courts reporter for a Florida newspaper, but left to assist then First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton with her syndicated newspaper column and speeches. In 1997, June became a special assistant to the president and spe presidential speechwriter writing speeches for President Bill Clinton on a range of issues from civil rights and race relations to education and healthcare policy. June then went on serving as chief speechwriter for Ms. Clinton's first U.S. Senate campaign in 2000. June will be joining the NYU family this fall as communications director at NYU Shanghai. Tonight's event will be moderated by Von Hillard, Vaughn is an award-winning journalist and political reporter for NBC News, notably covering the special election Senate race in Alabama between Roy Moore and Doug Jones and the entirety of the 2016 presidential uh, campaign as an embedded reporter from the Iowa coffee shop stops to election night at Trump headquarters in New York. Vaughn first started at NBC News in July 2013 as a Tim Russert Fellow. This event would not have been possible without the coordination and support of the staff of the Bradness Center along with, the, uh, call, with, uh, along with our colleagues at NYU Washington, D.C. Uh, please join us in the lobby for a light reception after the event. Um, and thank you and enjoy the program. We all good? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. All right. We'll talk a lot here, too. Uh, thank you all for having us here this evening, and thank you to Kevin. This is June. This is John. And so over the next hour here, and then we'll take some questions afterwards. But uh, this is exciting for me uh, because I have been here in D.C. for about five years, so I haven't been around the scene that long myself here. And so this is an opportunity for me, and I think that for a lot of the people here, uh, the question is, where are you going to go be in the next couple of years? And what are the opportunities to present themselves? And just a little piece from June, I think, how old were you when you started off with Hillary Clinton? Um, I was 23. 23 my years second old. second job, yeah. And she was the first lady. She, she was the first lady, yes. She was the first lady. Yeah. And so kind of along the lines here, as we'll discuss, is sort of those opportunities. And suddenly you can find yourself in those situations. Yeah, no. Quite, yeah. It was random. Yeah, very How lucky. did you get connected? Um, so I was a cops and courts reporter down in Florida. And, um, and you know, I was definitely much more of a partisan and a Democrat, and I knew I had to get out of journalism because I wanted to take a side. And um, so I wrote a letter, oh no, I called my friend, you know, I had friends who were interning in DC, so I called one friend and he said, you know what, Hillary Clinton's speechwriter would love you. He just had a, th he was interning in the White House, and he just had this thought, and I'm like, okay. So send, you know, fax, this was fax. Uh, fax me your resume and a cover letter, and I'll get it to her, I'm like, okay. And I just never, ever thought it would work. So, um, so I didn't sweat it. I just sort of like, you know, I'd sweat so many cover letters before and, you know, just took hours agonizing over every word. This one I didn't sweat because I thought there was no chance in hell. 
So I, um, so I just wrote it. It was like a paragraph or two, and I faxed it to my friend, and he got it to her, and you know, crickets, nothing happened. Um, but luckily, I live in D.C. My parents live in D.C., so I, when I came to visit them, I um, called Lisa Muscatine, who was Hillary's speechwriter, and said, I'm coming to town. Would you do an informational interview? And she said yes. And I said, great. And it was awesome because you know I got to go to the White House, and I was like, if nothing else comes of this, I get to see the old executive office building, and this is amazing. We had a good conversation. And, um, and then I went back to Florida, and nothing happened. And then out of the blue, like a couple weeks later, her assistant called me and said, we have an opening. Um, Hillary's going to write a column, and she needs an assistant, you know, someone to research it and like, you know, write early drafts. And I'm like, all right. So I tried out for that. I sent, like, you know, you do a blind audition kind of thing. You write a sample column, and then they judge it. This is a long story. I'm sorry. And to, make, uh, to shorten it, um, uh, I got the job. Um, it took a while because um, they were agonizing over what to do. Then I just, and I was ready to go to Florida. So I'm like, I'm coming up anyway. I'll volunteer. So I volunteered, and then a week into my volunteering, she said, you got the job. So, um, and that was like, all right, you know? It was like, whoa, and I just never, ever thought it would happen. And like months later, she told me the reason she even kept me in mind was that she loved my cover letter. So <laughs> you just never know. <laughs> I think what we'll get at, and we're gonna go into some personal anecdotes along the way, because ultimately, you, you stayed with the Clintons. All I the did. way the administration. Yep, I did. And then you were with, Hillary. Back in the State Department, yes. So one of those lines along the way, it's, it's, it's when you meet these people, it's a matter of where those things can take you. Yeah. In those yeah. words. Yeah. It's kind of like college, right? It's sort of like the friends you meet in these campaigns or political families, you know, you're, you're always connected. So. And that worked out for John. <laughs> I did. Same, same thing. You, would you mind telling everybody kind of, yeah, your, how you got involved in speech writing. Sure. And sort of that trajectory of kind of where initial meetings happen and then kind of how that took you. Yeah, it, it's a similar story. I was um, just out of law school. Um, it was 1990, and I was clerking for a federal judge in New York City, and uh, it, it, these clerkships are a year long, and I wanted to do something political early in my career. And I said, sort of three quarters of the way through the clerkship, I came down to Washington, and I talked to everybody I knew in Washington, and that took about an hour. <laughs> and. <laughs> Uh, I wasn't quite sure how to go about this. I was uh, had a law firm, a couple of law firms, uh, uh, waiting to to uh, for my own answer about whether I would come to work for them after the clerkship. But I just was holding off. I thought, gee, it would be really great uh, to go and do something political in Washington. Uh, the short of it is, um, because I was telling all my friends what I wanted to do, and my judge knew what I wanted to do, and. Uh, my professors, former professors, knew what I wanted to do. Um, as a result of my uh, letting all these people know generally that I was interested in coming down to do something political, a person I'd met in law school knew someone in the vice president's office, and they were looking for a speechwriter, and they wanted someone who was available soon, who had good recommendations, and was willing to work for very little money which is how a lot of people get yes, their start in Washington. Very little money. <laughs> yes. And um, I came down and, and uh, talked to uh, the deputy chief of staff, uh, Spencer Abraham, uh, who was later a senator from Michigan, and then secretary of energy and the chief of staff. The vice president's office was Bill Crystal, And they hired me and, and uh, was as a speechwriter. And, uh, and uh, Spencer Abraham told me, he said, well, the vice president's never really had a speechwriter like like, like the one we're hiring, uh, that is someone to work on political speeches and just uh, 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 things other than major addresses. He had a guy on the staff who was a foreign policy expert who did these major foreign policy speeches, but they needed someone to do everything else. And, and Vice President Quayle had never really had uh, someone uh, uh, full-time doing that. He had, he had just sort of done his own thing. He'd been a senator uh, uh, prior to being elected vice president, of course. Anyway, he's, this was the midterm elections of 1990, and they said, we'll see how it works out. We'll hire, I was hired in August. If this works out, we'll keep you after the election, but it might not, and this is just kind of a, let's see how things, we'll see if we need you. <laughs> and I thought, well, the worst possible scenario is that I work for two and a half months on the White House staff. Um, 
Uh, but the best scenario played out, which is they hired me for two months and forgot about the two months and kept me on. <laughs> Finally, I mentioned to Spence Abraham, I said, wasn't this a probationary job? He said, no, you're fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's how I got into it. And, and I make a, that's a serious point I'm making about making, making sure your friends know what you want to do because um, this is really how you, you talk to people with interesting jobs in Washington and just about everyone will tell you, if they're being honest, they will think of a person who thought of them or connected them to someone else or just decided to give them a break. I mean, Dick Cheney, you hear him talk about his career uh, coming to Washington 24 years old, 25 years old, a PhD student, and how he ended up White House Chief of Staff when he was 33 or 34 years old. And it was just people along the way uh, 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 seeing what he was interested in and A, talking to B and B, talking to C and things. Um, things following from that. Another, another good way of becoming a presidential speechwriter is go to work for a governor who gets elected president. <laughs> you just got to find that governor. <laughs> what do you guys, I, I think oftentimes uh, younger people, they hear the words, it's about who you know. And I think that oftentimes there's a pejorative uh, meaning to that. And yet, it seems like from what you both articulate, it's a matter of relationships. And what type of people have you seen from not only you guys, but your experiences that have worked in these offices that uh, you, you, you lasted, you, you, you just saw, you told me you saw Dan Quayle last week. Uh, that's a relationship that is you know, more than 20 years, 30 years strong. How important is that when people are presenting themselves as individuals in a, in a very competitive sphere? Uh, what, what are they looking for and how does that relationship last in the long run? By, by speaking and questioning, by uh, establishing a friendship, how does that, what does that look like? Well, I, I remember I called one of my best friends. As soon as I got this job offer to go to write speeches for the vice president, then it hit me that this is not a job you ease into. On day one, you're going to be given an assignment and to write a speech, and it's probably going to be due in 48 hours or 72 hours. And it's sort of this heaviness uh, settled on me <laughs> that as soon as I started, I really... I really, really better be at the top of my game. And I remember saying to one of my best friends from law school, calling him to tell him what, what was about to happen. And he said, oh, don't worry at all, Johnny. He said, just make yourself indispensable. And I thought, well, that's, a, that's good advice. How exactly am I to do that? Um, and of course, you think about it, nobody is indispensable. But what he was saying to me was just be, just work very hard be reliable, and be a good colleague. Uh, I, 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 I think uh, one of the greatest experiences I've, I've, I've had is working for the George W. Bush for President campaign in Austin, Texas uh, in, in 2000. And uh, that just was a magical gathering of people, just wonderful people, everybody. I mean, if there were rivalries or, or pettiness or anything like that, I was immune uh, from it, and I was definitely uh, unaware of it. It just was a very congenial, friendly, uh, smooth operating team. Everybody pointed in the same direction and everybody moving forward. Um, campaigns tend to be that way, otherwise uh, otherwise they don't turn out well. But um, it, it, it's really important to like the people you work with, to be liked by them, and, 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 and even more than that, to like the person you work for. Um, that takes away some of the some of uh, some things that would be burdens on you, um, uh, and so I just think uh, 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 indispensable to me to me just means being reliable and being someone that uh, people like dealing with. Yeah, that I totally agree with that. It's like um, uh, you know, yeah, you get the speech, and, and so often it's like a last minute deal, and you're like panicking, and you're like, okay, I cannot mess this up. So, and it's a lot of stress, but if you can like really like sort of deal with it and produce a good product, most of the time, you get a great reputation. And it's also key, like so, it's like, being a good colleague, low drama, you know, like I definitely took assignments and just went away and produced decent copy or decent speeches. And then when people have edits, I was diplomatic about them. I wasn't a prima donna, but oh my God, you don't understand genius. You know, you just have to be, you know, even though I might have been thinking that, but you know, it's all about like, it's all about being very diplomatic, being a good colleague, being someone who's easy to work with. 
um, and not complaining. And so, and also I had this like, because I was young, I was 23, 24, 25, um, I was grateful for the opportunity. Mm. So I sort of just like kept my head down and got things done. Looking back now that I'm a middle-aged woman, I feel like maybe I should have been a little more pushy um, because I was so like, oh my God, I can't believe I have this. And I wish I'd been a little bit more assertive. But, um, but overall, um, your reputation will like carry you very far. And if people know you're reliable, you're, you, know, you don't panic, you don't fail, and, and you're easy to work with, you're not gonna be a prima donna, um, that reputation stays with you and people 20 years down the line remember that and, and it will help you, you never know when, but it will help you at some point. And, uh, and, and you have warm, you know, they have warm feelings for you, you have warm feelings for them, and, and then you can tap that network, so. Well, and, uh, um, and also um, the, the principal knows that you're reliable. Yes. And I remember Vice President Cheney saying to me one time, I always wrote for him the entire eight years. I, I wrote for both him and the president. And he just, I remember one time he, 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 he said, don't let anyone make your life difficult. He said, uh, you're doing things the way I need them done. And, um, and you know, I, I didn't hold that out, hold that over anyone, but I just remember appreciating that, that level of confidence. I think a lot of people in this room are familiar with John Favreau. Uh, he was one of the, he was the speechwriting director for President Obama, and he's now operating this podcast, Pod Save America. And the people that hear John Favreau now, he's a very outspoken activist on the front lines. Uh, for you, and I think often most people that come to Washington are are getting involved in politics because they want to be politically engaged. How can they make a difference? And when you're a speechwriter you're essentially representing the principal, speaking for the principal, writing for the principal. To what extent was that balance like when working for your principals, when you were politically, I know, June, you worked on a lot of domestic issues mm -hmm. that you were passionate about. Mm -hmm. What was that process like in infusing your own thoughts, uh, uh, opinions, knowledge base with that of trying to accomplish the goal of uh, representing the principal and what you wrote? Um. It was pretty easy. Um, I definitely am, I hate to say it, I'm still a Clinton Democrat. I'm a moderate, you know, now liberal because of where the world is going, but um, Democrat. So I, I didn't have any sort of, I was politically aligned with them. And then um, what was great is that I, because I was one of the few minority speechwriters, I got all the race speech, I got a lot of the race speeches and I got immigration speeches. And, um, and that was easy because it was like everyone was aligned on the immigration issue, on immigration good, you know? Um, you know, and what America is not defined by a race, but by our common ideals. All those things were like amazing for me to help formulate for the president, and, and, and there was no controversy there, you know, unlike today. But, um, but so, so, so it was not, I, I, I didn't have any sort of like crisis of conscience and sort of, because was, I was aligned. Um, you know, I, I don't, um, yeah, so, so, yeah, go on that. Because 1997, 1998, yeah. President Clinton, he announced that he was going to go and kind of do a year of town halls. Right. When it came to race relations. Right, right, exactly. Uh, it didn't necessarily, I'll let you speak to yeah. it, uh, but from my understanding of history, it didn't go as necessarily as, uh, yes. the administration had hoped. Yeah. And it was a tough issue. He got a lot of criticism for, yeah. That he wasn't forceful enough and yeah, gave very exactly. overarching themes of it's important exactly. to have a conversation. Yeah. So how did you, when you were planning those town halls, yeah. kind of the, what was that, because was there a certain extent of coaching, town hall formats are different. What was that like in communicating a message? I'm sure you had thoughts specifically right. on race right. in working with the president. How yeah. closely did you work with him? What was that like? So like there was, I, there was, there was another speechwriter who worked on those two and there's a whole race commission, or what, I can't remember what they were called, the One America Initiative. So they're all involved, you know, Chris Headley, all those guys. Um, so, and I didn't, so I wasn't on, on deck for every single speech, but there was one speech I got to work on, which was the 40th anniversary of desegregation at Little Rock Central High School. And um, that was amazing, um, because it really did sort of, it was more like a, it was, a, it was more a statement of the case. It didn't have many solutions, unfortunately, because it's so hard, we haven't figured that out. Um, but it was sort of like a, remarkable that he was actually commenting on it. It was sort of like a proto-Barack Obama speech on like, let's, re you know, let's recognize that we still have 
so many hurdles, you know, segregation ended then, but, you know, we still self segregate you know, so it was this great, um, I don't know what it was, but it was just like, it conjured up the right feelings, and, and we thought we were on a great path. But as the initiative continued, and I wasn't involved in the initiative part, it was just very hard to speak 100% frankly, you know, and, and maybe that's where, you know, we're reaping or whatever. So how, do, how did you the, do that then? How did you, because you had, I'm sure, thoughts. Yeah. Then how do you write a speech outlining not knowing the extent to which the, the administration wants to go? I think, well, so I wrote that speech with my um, boss, Michael Waldman, who is the director of speech writing. And we sort of just wrote what we thought, you know, and we wrote about um, self-segregation in schools and, you know, um, and, and, you know, so, so it, was more, we, it was more like a honoring the, the bravery of the people of the past and the, the self-segregation that takes place. And then the um, America is changing. It's not just a black and white country. It's a multi, you know, more than half the population of California is going to be all kinds of more. So, so it was dealing a little bit with the multicultural part. So, um, so we just wrote it. And, um, and then we got it to Clinton. And, you know, so there are all these people kibitzing on it. And, oh, no, no, we can't say that. We can't say that. We can't say that. And, um, and then Clinton got it, and he just sort of, you know, called us up at like 2 a.m. And we were working on it in the hotel. His, his person called us at 2 a.m. Can you come see him and talk to him about it? And um, we're like, okay, where is he? He's at his mother in law's house. And we're like, oh my God, where is that? You know, and so we had to wake up people to find out where that was. And we woke up I, someone, and like we got there, 2 a.m. He's in his Hope Watermelon Festival t shirt, and we're hanging out with him. And he had rewritten it. He really had t written like a good part of it, t reminisced about his childhood, and talked about being alive during, um, you know, during the um, integration, and and, um, and and sort of like did his masterly Clinton thing about you know understanding all sides. And it was, I don't know, it was great. Um, and I can't, I don't know. It was it was it was sort of like a frank address of what the state what status was, honoring the past, and then. Going forward, it was more like, let's recognize this. But it didn't, you know, and then let's have a conversation. But I, I don't know how, you know, the jury, you know, the conversation went as it did, so. Um, I always say that uh, uh, a person who is elected president of the United States, definitely President Clinton, President Bush, who I worked for, is entirely capable of writing his own speeches. But he doesn't have time. He's not gonna have time. The president speaks 500 times a year. Um, so that's why you have, glad, glad to say, uh, the speech writing office. But your job really is to remember that ideally the work that you're doing is expressing the president's best thoughts on the matter at hand. Not yours, not your choice. I mean, you're obviously going to, to make the case as strong, strongly as it can be made. You want to uh, marshal the best arguments. You want to uh, uh, bring uh, the most compelling facts and anecdotes that you're able to gather, th either through your own background or through the uh, uh, through the uh, the use of uh, your own research or the research of your of your of your uh, of your speechwriting office staff. But a writer should never confuse <laughs> uh, a speech for a president that they're doing uh, with their own body of written material. You are not contributing to your corpus of work. I don't believe you should think of it that way. You should think of it as the president's words. And so if you're emphasizing something in a way that the president really wouldn't, of course the president's going to catch it in the editing process and will be annoyed by it. And he will be really annoyed if you do it to him again. And so uh, that's why, although there are tons of able writers, the uh, proportion of them who would be able speech writers for another is is not a hundred percent. It's 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 uh, it's significantly less than that. And I think some people who <clears throat> uh, might be thought of as as good potential speech writers don't don't really aren't really happy in the position because they don't like to change their style to suit <laughs> the president they're working for, and they think of it in terms of uh, of, it, of it being their their own body of work. Uh, in terms of uh, writing about things you care about, you're better if you care about it. You're better if you agree with yeah. what it is you're writing. Um, you bring I, that passion. Right, yeah. right. I'm a lawyer by training, and so uh, 
I, 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 I can make an argument for the opposing position. As a matter of fact, one of our professors told us, the way to become the best advocate for your own position is to become an expert in your adversary's position, because that's where you spot the weaknesses, and, the, and the, uh, it's where the, you, you will know where the listener is going to see where you skipped a logical step, uh, or things of that nature. But by the same token, you don't want to spend every day applying that talent uh, and writing uh, uh, arguments for things you, you don't agree with. So you can do that on occasion. I think it was more common in my own case to be writing about something I didn't care about, <laughs> not so much something I didn't agree with, but I, I, I didn't have strong opinions on every matter of federal policy. And sometimes I thought, oh, I can, you can teach it round or flat. <laughs> John, you're one of the few that has served all eight years of an administration. You worked with Vice President Cheney, also worked with uh, George W. Bush. Can you walk us through sort of how you get to the point of putting the words on paper and sort of that conversation? I mean, ca talking directly with the president, like for instance, I mean, you can go through any number of whether it's been, you know, speech on TARP, whether speech Hurricane Katrina, or the war in Iraq, or I think I was going through September 20th, 2001, in that address to Congress. And the words that came out of the president's mouth were, quote, these demands are not open to negotiation or discussion. The Taliban must act and act immediately. They will hand over the terrorists or they will share in their fate. From this day forward, any nation that continues to harbor or support terrorism will be regarded by the United States as a hostile regime. Americans should not expect one battle, but a lengthy campaign unlike any other we have seen. It may include dramatic strikes, visible on television and covert operations, secret even in success. How do those words ultimately get spoken there inside of the Capitol building? <clears throat> Yeah, with specific reference to that speech, uh, that would have been direction we got from the president, from Dr. Rice, who at the time was uh, the national security advisor. I don't remember, I saw the president a lot in the days after 9-11 um, because there were, there, was, there were a number of speeches before the, the, the one on September 20th, which was the third, it was the Thursday of the week following, and that was the, that was the, uh, speech to the joint session, uh, but he spoke at the National Cathedral on Friday uh, at the service of uh, remembrance. Um, but anyway, so uh, that would have been direction we got from the president. We, meaning myself, Mike Gerson, who was the chief speechwriter, and Matthew Scully, the three of us were colleagues starting in Austin. And starting, uh, it, uh, starting in Austin, uh, by dividing up the speeches and then editing them together. We ended up writing them together and throughout uh, the President's, uh, ca uh, Governor Bush's campaign and then President Bush's first term, we literally wrote on that basis three guys in the same office at the same computer writing the speeches line by line. And Gerson, who's now a, a columnist with the Washington Post, uh, very often would come in uh, even even before a single word was written, with a very clear uh, uh, sense and, and and clear direction on what the, how the speech was going to be put together, uh, kind of a, a, a theoretical construct, and so we often started uh, uh, from that. Uh, a major speech like that, addressed to the joint session, uh, State of the Union, there will be input from the president on the front end and then a lot of info, input from the president once the thing has been drafted and put through the staffing process and reviewed. These, uh, uh, he, I mean, he, he, give, he would give a lot of input on all speeches, but these, a State of the Union is a different thing altogether because you have uh, dress rehearsals in the family theater of the White House where the president reads it through aloud and the speechwriters are there. A lot of changes are made. Uh, that's in distinction uh, 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 to um, uh, uh, the, the dedication of a museum or something. Well, the president's going to make his edits on it, but you're not going to get a lot of direction on where to go with this speech. It is, it's going to be assumed that the speechwriters are able to put together appropriate remarks. Ronald Reagan dies, Gerald Ford dies, uh, Pope John Paul II dies. Uh, Can you uh, take us into the room of what that process looks like? Who are you getting direction from? Where is that direction? What is that conversation? You mean on a big policy on, speech? On a big, on a big policy speech. Are you working with the chief of staff? Are you working with? What yeah, and well, there, and there are policy people in the are White you House. Somebody, I mean, are you right. going down the hall? What is that? Oh yeah, you'll get direction. I mean, there will be oh, there will be big picture direction from uh, the White House communications director. Okay, there's this is this is going to be Social Security week, 
And then, well, okay, well, what's our policy? Well, talk to the policy people on that, but it's understood the president wants these, these five principles to be, to, be, uh, to be followed in whatever reform is enacted. So this is gonna be a speech on the five principles. This is gonna be the big speech at the beginning of the week. Then he's gonna do a town hall meeting in Kansas the next day, and that's gonna, he, he needs a page of talking points. He doesn't need a speech. Uh, and so you will, you will just put those, put those things together. Now, speech writing, we don't have to come up with the policy, thankfully. <laughs> uh, but there are great policy people in the White One of the 10,000 joys of working for the President of the United States is the uh, talent uh, around you. Uh, you, you, want, you want someone to tell you about trade or whatever else, pick up the phone yeah. and there's going to be a great expert to tell you everything you want to know and to tell it to you in very precise you know, um, uh, uh, ironclad, clear, understandable terms, uh, which helps you a lot to understand it, to be able to write it yourself. I will say there are, there, I, I, I can think of a couple examples where the, the fact that a speech was on the calendar drove the policy process. Yeah. Oh, and I, and it was well, in the, it created a deadline, right? Well, right, I was in the deputy chief yeah. of staff's office one day, and, um, and it was called the deputies meeting, and, and um, I, I was there, and, and uh, 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 Deputy Chief of Staff said to me, uh, do you guys have what you need for that speech on thus and so next Thursday? I said, no, we don't, we don't have anything. We know where the, we know the event is, but, but that's it. And, um, and he turns <laughs> to the person in charge of the policy, he said, or, or the deputy of, of that office, he said, you tell your boss that if we don't have the policy by the day after tomorrow, the speech is canceled. And um, the policy appeared in the speech writing office uh, uh, in due course. Um, but as you say, uh, the speech writing sometimes drives the policy process, but typically not, and it shouldn't. I had that question because you know, I've, I was unable to cover the administrations you guys work for, but uh, been able to travel with Vice President Pence. And he has one, for the first year of his administration, he had one speechwriter who was essentially going from those campaign type rallies to overseas trips. And it was impressive to watch somebody put into words and articulate a very different tone, a different message uh, day to day. Question out of that is, how do you do that? Campaign versus the more of the actual policy, actually White House official side of it. Because you guys both have done campaigns, and official, and you guys did it within the same period of time. How is that process like, and what is that working? Is it different working with the campaign versus the official side? Um, I think the campaign is definitely more like um, soft dash. Like there's a there's a stump speech, there's a message. You just repurpose that message for every audience. You know, like you sort of like redo it. You know, do the same but different every time. And um, and it's all about applause lines and you know getting the crowd into it. When you're the president, it's it's you definitely like you try to bring in more of the sweep of history, why this is important, and 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 sort of like taking America along this road, um, and 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 so, so and there's not always, but usually there's a little more time to think it through, you know, to like to make it beautiful. You get like um, policy guys will give you a fact sheet, right, and your your job is to like write a speech based on a fact sheet that doesn't read like a fact sheet, right? So there you bring in that poetry and you have that time. Um, yeah, and the campaign is just very responsive and like what's the sound bite? And even now in the internet age, like we worried about sound bites. I don't even think sound bites are an issue anymore, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, like everything is online everywhere instead of, because before in the 90s, 80s, it's like, what's that 20 seconds that's gonna get on the evening news? You know, what's the line? And everyone's all the pol all the senior people are sweating the the soundbite. Right. I don't think that happens anymore, right? No. Like, because few to choose from. Um, yeah. uh, 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 Dick Cheney t uh, writes in his book about uh, when he was chief of staff to President Ford, and they lost, of course, to uh, Carter and Mondale in '76, which at, to that point was the closest presidential election in 60 years, and Ford told Cheney, okay, I want this to be a smooth transition. So Cheney immediately got in touch with the Carter people. And the way he puts it in his book, he, he said, overnight you go from how do we beat them to how do we help them? <laughs> and this is when the camp, when the election's over, it's over. And so if the speechwriters keep writing, 
like the election is on, it's not going to sound right. And because it is very different. Campaigning is about, um, to use an unfavored word, uh, dividing, <laughs> defining choices, and, and um, especially- Contrast. Yeah, contrast. Oh, that contrast. Right? Um, no, Where's that's the it. contrast? Exactly right, exactly right. And, um, and by the time the votes are cast, the idea of campaign speeching is to have it as clearly set in the mind of the voter who's listening as you can possibly do so. Uh, um, what is the choice in this election and what are the stakes of making choice A versus choice B? That's one of the, and then of course when you're president it's all about, as June said, speaking uh, in, in broader tones. Uh, uh, Jeff Schessel, your uh, colleague, Clinton yeah. colleague, uh, describe the narrative arc of a presidency. The speeches are, of course, they can differ, but they should all have some sort of a thread uh, that goes through them through the presidency, and you should attempt in every way you can uh, uh, to bring to bring people together. Uh, there's another difference that, that um, you discover uh, after working on a campaign and then your boss is elected president. In, your, in, in, the, in, the, um, in the campaign speeches, you're always saying things like, I will propose to the Congress uh, such and such, or, or if elected president, I will direct the Secretary of State to perform such and such an, an act. And then when you're president, you're saying, I am proposing to the Congress. I have directed the Secretary of State. Um, that uh, You go from the language of uh, persuasion uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and vote gathering to the language of power. Did you guys share what your principles were like? Because you guys both stuck, I know when Vice President Quayle left office, you continue to work with him. You can went on, worked on- uh, Hillary's. 2000 Senate campaign. Yeah. Which yep. fun fact, I didn't realize this. Who was she was running against initially on the Republican side before he bowed out of the race? Oh, Giuliani? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Things could have been a little different. Yeah, yeah. Um, what was that like, though? What were your principles like? What was your relationship and working and, and personal relationship like? Um, so with Hillary, it was um, definitely like the smartest person I've ever worked with. Um, like it, she's just a very, very, very smart person, and you cannot get away with bad stuff. You know, like she just sees it right away. She's very kind about it, but you're just like, if you just give her bad, you're you're just, I avoid I did my best to avoid it. Um, and she, you know, this didn't come through in her campaigns, but she's actually a lovely, warm woman, you know, like, um, a, you know, just very gracious and, 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 um, and funny, really funny. So, um, and, you know, and I, I, um, I started out ghostwriting or helping her with her column. And, you know, it was just like, you know, sometimes me and her talking about it. And it was just kind of just a warm relationship. Um, the president, President Clinton, um, he was always very nice to me too, and like you know, once again, really smart. And like, he held back a bit because I think he knew I, I came from Hillary's staff. So if he didn't like something, I didn't. He didn't always tell me right away <laughs> because you know I could tell he didn't like it, but he was trying to be because he knew you know. So, um, but also very smart and like amazing. Like there, you, um, there are a few times you know you get to talk to him about a speech. For me, I only had a few times after the speech I got to talk to him, and we'd go over the speech after he delivered it, and he would tell me, you know, why he tweaked a line, and it literally was because he was reading the audience, and he could tell that he should do it this way instead, and he, you know, it was just like, a, you know, being in the audience of a master communicator, um, and and it was like a, you know, not, is it a clinic or a seminar? Like he was just really just telling me, oh, I, and I did it this way because of that. Um, you know, so so they were both very you know kind and generous. And um, uh, when Clinton was going to China for the first, you know, 1998, um, they like knew I was Chinese American. And so even though the Clinton White House they divided foreign and domestic speechwriters, um, you know, there was a foreign team and domestic team. Um, both Clintons wanted to be sure I got to go. So they there are those personal touches too that are um, quite you know. Heartwarming, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, President Bush, I love the guy. He, he was a wonderful person to work for, demanding, um, but a very appreciative person. I never saw him slight anyone. I never saw him 
uh, uh, condescend, just a, a very decent fellow. Um, if I had never met the man, I would still feel sitting here that I had a sense of the kind of person he was because um, he is an easy person to read. He, 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 um, his feelings go directly to his expression on his face. Uh, happy, sad, annoyed, bored, <laughs> irritated, um, I immediately. Um, I, always, I always describe him as, uh, there are people who thought he was impatient but he is not an impatient man. He is, in fact, patient. And I have, on many occasions, heard, watched him hear someone out. Um, whatever it was, whatever the point they wanted to make, he would, he would listen to it. But he would not be patient anymore when they started to repeat themselves. And he would say, you're losing altitude, or something <laughs> like that. Um, but, but, uh, but patient, uh, 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 considerate. Uh, a great memory. Uh, he knew everybody's name. Uh, he would call you by name. If he saw you on a Saturday, we had many unexpected uh, events that required uh, fast, uh, uh, quickly produced speeches on a weekend, and he would thank you for coming in on a Saturday or Sunday, uh, which is, of, co of course, it was your job, but he, he, he was very considerate in that way. Um, uh, uh, he was also a very serious editor. Uh, of his speeches, uh, line by line, and he um, he could read a speech once, an eight-page, ten-page speech, read it once, throw it down on his desk, look up at the ceiling, and recite to you that speech in outline form. Once, on one reading, uh, he would internalize it. He had a real sense of how things were structured, and he could find the the one or two paragraphs in a speech that were out of place, and he called me one morning. It was really early. And as, as I recall it to this day, I was just sitting at my desk. It was about 7 o'clock, and I was staring down into a cup of coffee. And my phone rang, and that little window on your phone says POTUS. And, um, and I said, yes, sir. He said, well, hey, we got, and it was a speech coming up that morning. And he was going to be leaving in about an hour. There's a hotel across town. And, and um, he said, I got a couple little changes on this speech. And the speech was one of these tough ones that had it had one part, and then it had another part that had to be said that day, but it didn't really fit with yeah, the first yeah, part. Yeah, yeah, those are the words. <laughs> anyway, so in the middle, the middle of it, <laughs> the president says, what, what's flow. this paragraph in the middle of page four? And I said, uh, um, You've got to blame the policy staff, right? <laughs> I just, whatever I mumble, is something <laughs> about, well, it's, it's just in the nature of a transition. It, 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 and he goes, it's just words, isn't it? <laughs> and I said, yes, sir. He said, take it out. And uh, he would just, he would spot those things. And uh, Vice President Cheney um, uh, was not a big editor. He was, he, he, would, he, would, he would like the speech or not. He would, he would modestly say, oh, I'm not a speech writer. But he would, he would write inserts. And he had a beautiful, beautiful hand. And he would write uh, in this flawless handwriting these inserts without any cross outs or anything else. It just had perfectly formed in his mind what he wanted to say and where to put it in the speech, but but less of a less of a of a, of a line editor unless, but he, don't be wrong on a fact or a piece of history or something, Cheney's going to be on top of it and and uh, he wouldn't be he wasn't pedantic or anything like that but he would make little notations and and he cared about his speeches he called me one day. John, I got us into some trouble, <clears throat> and I said. Oh, <laughs> and he said, "Yeah, the president, president's going to Europe, and he was going to speak at uh, uh, forget what one of these big dinners where the president's got to be funny." And Cheney, Cheney said, "I got to stand up there in his place tomorrow night, and I got to I got to speak for ten minutes and and be funny." <laughs> uh, and then he says, "I don't do funny." <laughs> And I said, oh, don't worry about it, Mr. Vice President. Matthew Scully and I will write you a little speech that <laughs> that will be just have some nice stuff in it. And um, and um, and so I talked to him a little bit about it. I think I, I think Mrs. Cheney. I think I talked to her a little bit. Anyway, um, uh, he Dick Cheney was a wonderful guy to work for. Uh, I, I enjoyed him every bit as much as I enjoyed uh, uh, President Bush as a person. Just nice and considerate and appreciative and, uh, and, and always treated everyone, uh, met everyone as an equal. I will add one thing about D Vice President Quayle. Um, he's the only boss I've ever worked for who would write an entire speech and give it to me. Um, 
and he did this on a fairly regular basis when he was vice president of the United States. Uh, he would, that was back when you would, you would share disks. And uh, the first time it happened, I was called to his office in the West Wing, and it was early in the morning. And I didn't know why I was being called in. And uh, I walked in, he goes, John, I wrote a speech this weekend. And he holds up a blue disk. And he hands it to me, and, and there was a fully written speech. Now, Dan Quayle uh, was a newspaper man for some years before he uh, entered politics. And so uh, he could write, and he could write fast. Uh, when I worked for him as a former vice president, and he had a newspaper column, he could write a six, 700 word column in a half hour. Where do you guys see, uh, this president is known to go off script. Uh, he is known to go without a teleprompter. He speaks in the White House uh, when reporters are in there. He speaks off the cuff. Uh, there's also the, a demand in what people, uh, there's a desire for what they say authenticity, right? <laughs> and you see it in Senate campaigns. You see Beto or work dropping the F-bomb here, <laughs> dropping the F-bomb there. Okay. And it seems like there is a demand among the electorate that we saw in this last election, and the president has continued it. Where do you guys see the art of the word, the art of the speech, uh, and, and how do you convince the public that through the words that you are writing, that there is authenticity, that you're not just another politician? Because of Twitter, the demand to have quick, rapid responses that are not packaged up, perhaps in the way that you guys did. Where do you see, are you concerned about it, and where would you say to individuals running for office, and these midterms elections are in 2020, what would be your recommendation to a principal that you'd be working for now? Well, I mean, I don't think, I mean, so much of these times are not normal, but like, um, like if you just go back to Barack Obama, like the speeches made him, right? So there's still, I still believe that there's room for excellent speeches. And I think what made him so, sex, so successful was they were beautiful speeches. They were speech writerly speeches but they're still authentic, you know? So he was able to bring himself, you know, convey himself through quite, you know, amazing, beautiful words. And, um, and so there, there's still, and, and I think that's, that's where America, um, and so he, he came across as authentic, even though he was, you know, but he was also very articulately so authentic. And I think, um, so there's, I would still counsel a candidate to go that way. Um, um, and you need to say real things. That's, I think that's where you get in trouble, is when you're like saying beautiful things, but you're saying nothing. So of course, you know, like, um, uh, uh, so yeah, so, 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 so that, I think that's when it, when it really works, is you both say, you know, so Trump would say very real things, and like there was, there was not substance, but there was just something bracingly not true. I don't know what the word is, but like, you know, I, I think you could still find that, and um, and and I and and you should, uh, for the sake of comedy and the civilization and the country, let's think these things through and find a way to talk about them. Bring your authenticity in, but but in a way that, I don't know. I'm I'm like flailing. Well, here, so. well it, it, um, as an example, uh, President Trump's State of the Union speech was a pretty good speech. And, um, but that's because they wrote it and well, he read it, you know, right? Well, a, a year ago, yeah. when he first when he was first president, and he came out to give his first State of the Union, I, I was so curious, uh, what is he going to do? Because throughout that campaign in 2016, you'd see him. Um, he would come out, stand in front of a crowd. He'd reach in his jacket pocket, throw down a couple sheets of white paper with his own notes, and he would give a speech. And no one has ever run for president successfully doing this. Uh, no one. And, uh, and yet he did it. So when he came out for that first speech to Congress, I thought, is he going <laughs> to do that? Is he just going to reach in his pocket, throw something down? Of course, he didn't. And, um, <clears throat> and then, as I say, this, 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 the, the most recent one, I thought, you know, this was, this was uh, 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 his best thoughts put down in a polished way. And nothing inauthentic about it at all. Um, and it is, uh, and so as you were saying at, 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 the, at the outset, um, authenticity does not mean uh, declining to share with people your best thoughts or, or um, spending time uh, 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 polishing your words or working with writers. Um, I think 
I work a lot with CEOs now, and I remember one CEO a few years ago said to me, well, I, I'm not good at giving speeches. I said, well, you can be. You're good at everything else you've ever tried. Uh, it, it's, not some, it's not some mystery. I think some people just don't want to do it. Some people do want to do it. But it is, uh, it is something that uh, a person who is intelligent and has a point to make can do and can get better at. Um, and and um, one of the elements, it seems to me, will always be getting your best thoughts down in writing uh, just to prepare, like you prepare for, for anything else in life. Right, and the best speechwriters can really help you find your authentic voice, right? You're, they're, they're, as a speechwriter, we're listening to you and what you want to say and listening carefully and maybe doing some research on you. And then really, like, um, you know, n as you said earlier, like, we serve our principals and really capturing their voice. And that doesn't mean, like, you don't have to write it yourself, you know, you don't need to write it yourself if, as a principal as long as you find people who will help you um, say what you mean, but sure. better. <laughs> Can I tell you a quick story? Of, um, uh, I worked for Senator Dole in the 96 campaign, traveled across the country with him. Uh, for the last six months of the campaign. And uh, uh, at one point, uh, and I was writing speeches on the plane, and uh, at one point during the campaign, headquarters, uh, the senator traveled all the time. So headquarters would get in touch with me. Well, we now have, we have a policy address, and it wasn't written by anyone on staff, I don't think. I think it was done by a consultant. Um, but at any rate, we have this policy address that we want the senator to deliver uh, sometime this week. It's really important. And they told me this because it was my job as a speechwriter on the campaign plane to present this to the senator and, and tell him that it was really important that, that he deliver this speech. So I did, and I gave it to him. I said, well, this is, this is uh, they want you to do that, this speech this week, and uh, it's important. And uh, Dole looks at it, and <clears throat> he, makes no commitment to me about what his intentions are. And he looks at it, and, and then um, I thought, well, he'll, he'll let me know what he thinks. Well, he didn't. Well, I get another call from headquarters a day later. What, when's he going to give the speech? When's he going to? I said, well, I, I don't think there's going to be any speech. Uh, not, not this thing you had him give me give to him. No, 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 it's, it's really important. You, you, you go talk to him, and you tell me it's really important. You, you know. So. I found my opportune moment to go up to the senator on, on the plane, and um, I said, "Sir, um, you know that speech draft. Uh, uh, it's, I guess it's pretty important, and they they want to get it on the calendar. And um, so, if, if we need to make edits or whatever, I can I can get to work on those." And and Dole just looked at me, saying nothing. And I said, "You never want to see this again, do you?" And he just shakes his head. So I took it and <laughs> gave the bad news to headquarters. It's <laughs> <laughs> good. Uh, we've got some time to open up questions. Is everybody here? This is a question for Mr. M McConnell. Um, you mentioned that the difference between an election and or campaigning and working for somebody who is president is the language, language of gathering hope versus the language of power. Uh, how would you distinguish between those besides just the tense of grammar? No, uh, re yeah, really the point is, um, uh, is summed up in the example I gave. that a, a, a candidate for president says, I can do this as president. I intend to do this as president. I promise you I will do this as president. But then, uh, as the speechwriter learns, when you're writing for the president, they're saying, I am doing this. I am happy to tell you that I have just done this, or I am happy to tell you that the Secretary of State is going to the Middle East tomorrow because I have sent him. You're just, you're, you're just, uh, uh, it's, it's no longer the aspirations of a, of a presidential candidate, it is now the actions of a president. Uh, first of all, uh, these are very busy times. So thank you both for taking the time to uh, talk to us. Um, since you both have, have written for, uh, various uh, people, and when we talked about tone, um, did you find it difficult that, like, I mean, on the, uh, um, I mean, I guess Hillary and Bill, they, they have a similar tone to how they speak, but Dan Quayle and Dick Cheney appear 
almost different uh, of, of, of the words that they use and how they present their arguments. Um, so was it difficult for both of you to kind of um, find that, that tone and any, uh, uh, basically, how did you also find that tone for having to deal with uh, various people and politicians? <clears throat> Uh, you really have to uh, pay attention and learn and ask questions. Uh, as you say, um, George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, Bob Dole, Dan Quayle, I mean, you, very different in their styles. Uh, um, um, they all, of course, are um, comfortable speaking in public. And if you're comfortable speaking in public, you can read a speech that's decently written, uh, that follows the basic elements, which uh, one of the main ones of which is the sentences need to be short. It's not like writing an essay. It's, 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 it's the spoken word. And so it's a little bit different, and in some ways significantly different from uh, other types of writing. You've got to read it aloud, for example, if you've written it, because you've got to be careful that things don't rhyme <laughs> or you have uh, alliteration that's not intended uh, or any other sort of structural distractions that, uh, that, uh, that would hit the ear um, uh, differently from how you, how you would expect it. But um, uh, the main point of variation among the people that I've written speeches for is how they get into a speech, how they start it, what that first page is like, how they bond with the audience, and how they get comfortable. Uh, President Bush liked to do extensive acknowledgments, uh, so extensive that we wouldn't even write these things. They would be, they would be gathered up and 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 and, and you know, in, in entirely accurate. Uh, and it would be the mayor, the governor, the senator, the congressman, the local city councilman, the eighth grade band. I mean, he wanted to thank everybody. Yeah, Clinton too. We yeah. had just had acknowledgement pages. Did you write them or did you just no, list just them? No, we had to list them because if riff he wrote them, them, it would take right, forever. Right, forever, yeah. yeah. And, and he'd riff off them. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, I, I mean, uh, I mean, Vice President Quayle, I remember, he always liked to get right into his message. He would have, a, he would have something light at the top or he would get right into his message. Um, Vice President Cheney was a little more that way too. Bob Dole, if you wrote him quality jokes, he would he 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 would tell jokes for five or ten minutes. I mean, he <laughs> he he was uh, uh, Bob Dole. Uh, uh, you won't be surprised to learn liked people. He'd been in politics uh, uh, just since just a few years after he got out of the army in World War II, and and he he had a very good sense of humor. He made up a lot of jokes on his own. Um, and uh, he, he, he liked to do that kind of thing, and, and, uh, and, he, and he was good at it. Um, but um, really the main point of variation is if, if, if the text is, 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 is decently written, it's written for uh, as the spoken word, it doesn't have any kind of quirks that would be obviously unique to one person or another. Really, your, your, the important thing is how is he going to get into this speech and what, what's going to be, what's gonna be uh, uh, comfortable? Yeah, and related to that is like, um, you know, I worked for people, Clinton, um, Bill and Hillary Clinton are both excellent extemporaneous speakers. They really, as you've said, they don't really need um, speech writers. So what's your value added? Your value added is like um, finding that nugget or finding like the story that can sort of help them, as you said, get into the speech. Uh, finding, you know, the, the historical anecdote that will like sort of frame whatever policy you're proposing, or if you're visiting a country, you know, like where the U.S. relation, you know, the history of U.S. relations here. Um, so finding the historical nugget or the real person connection uh, or the biograph biographical story. Um, you know, Americans love biography and, and, and it's a great way to connect with an audience. So, so it's really finding those sort of factoids and, 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 and anecdotes that, that, that will help them launch the speech and, and, and and personalize the speech, um, uh, you know, and, and, and so you do that thinking for them, you do that prep for them, but then, you know, you know they can go, they can speak anywhere, but you just sort of do the tailoring for the audience. Um, and that's where your researchers can help yeah, a lot Yeah, and the too. researchers are very important on that, and, and, and it does, it's a bit of a struggle. Sometimes you're like, oh, there's nothing here. Right, right. You know, um, but that's the value added, and they very much appreciate that, because that's something they can't do on their own. They don't have time. Um, so. Right, and, and um, you know, for example, um, 
if, if I mean, the writers, you're, you're, you're so busy and you've got so many plates in the air, but if your researcher comes in and tells you, look, the president's gonna be speaking in front of a huge statue of General Grant, you're very happy to learn that in yeah. advance. <laughs> and, Get me stuff on Jennifer. Yeah, right. <laughs> you don't want to read it yeah. afterwards to the president, comma, speaking in front of a yeah. giant <laughs> statue of we General We did not Grant. refer to. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that. So you mentioned having different policy teams and research teams aiding you with drafting the speeches. To what extent are you performing personal research and how did you kind of come across the like fine tuning those research skills? I think it um, depends on how much time you have and how big a staff you have, right? Like on a campaign, you're largely I saw you're you know you're on your own a little bit. Um, and in the White House, you have interns, lots of them, and you have to send them down. You know, you got to figure out how to assign them and get the most out of them. Um, I'm sorry, I had another point. What was your other question? Oh, so on that is like um, to serve your client well or to serve your principal really well is you you should know their biography like backwards and forwards. And I I read all the bio, you know the quickie bios and you know the auto bio everything about them so that you knew you had this sort of catalog of personal stories from your principal and you read read all their old speeches as far back as possible so that you really internalize this person so that you could channel Hillary Clinton or Bill Clinton. Um, and, and so, so, so that's how you, sort, you, know, you, you get their voice that way. Um, and then, yeah, um, and you know, this was, <laughs> I was working before Google, so, <laughs> you know, so it was LexisNexis, you know, and um, Gale, Bio, you know, those old like auto dial things, and I think there was Netscape, so the interns were on Netscape, and, um, so it was harder, but you then you got your library, right? And um, look things up in the library. So so um, so yeah, I did a lot of personal research too because I'm very hands-on and a little bit of a like want to know everything. And and I it's like you know it when you see it. And instead of people interns like bringing you random things, and it's it's hard. Well, yeah, and you know sometimes only you know what you're looking for. Yeah, exactly. It's really hard to articulate, articulate right? And and that's true. I remember. Uh, uh, we had the assignment of uh, doing the president's dedication speech for the World War II Memorial. And one of my favorite writers of all time is Ernie Pyle, who wrote a daily column uh, in, uh, uh, th through most of the 1930s and throughout World War II and the day he, until the day he was shot dead by a sniper. Um, but talk about beautiful, beautiful writing. And so when, when that assignment came up, I, I mean, the first thing I thought was, we got to get Ernie Pyle in President Bush's speech on World War II. Every living person in the English-speaking world who remembers that war remembers Ernie Pyle and will be touched when they hear his <laughs> words. And, and you go looking for something nice in Ernie Pyle, I've got news for you. It's on every page. Uh, and so that was, that was just a joy and a delight. And then, um, uh, you know, uh, when, when an eminent person dies or you are preparing for that event, you, you really can't say to the researcher, well, you, you know, give me, give me 10 things on Ronald Reagan. You know, he, he, Reagan was my hero, so it's not a good example. I had a lot of stuff in the bank. But by the same token, um, if, if it's so, you're going to be giving someone their due, you really can't leave you can't that farm it out. You're right yeah. you can't leave that reading to the to the research you've got to do it on your own and uh, and there's a there's a, a, a line you've probably both heard uh, uh, Henry Kissinger who worked on the White House in the White House for a long time even when he was Secretary of State he was also a member of the White House staff you can believe it he was the National Security <laughs> Advisor but he said that a White House is a place where you spend intellectual capital you do not accumulate intellectual capital, and in speech writing especially, your, your favorite <laughs> stories from history, your favorite quotations. Yeah, give them out. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, give you, them away. Yeah, yeah right, right. Um, but that, that is something uh, 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 akin to research, but it's, it's really more uh, um, properly termed, I guess, background knowledge, which, which every speech writer brings uh, to it. And one of the best parts was like, um, you know, being a former reporter was interviews, right? Like you, because you're calling from the White House, 
you could interview almost anyone to get the background, right? And so that was pretty cool. And and you know, just to get the anecdote, the live anecdotes, and you know, from the friends, and or you know, um, you know, if you're doing a, a eulogy for just a friend, you know, like a friend that there's not a lot of written material about, you're interviewing all these cool people and getting these great stories, and and that was actually a, a delight too. What's your favorite writer and why? Who is your favorite writer? Um, you know, uh, I always feel inadequate when I answer questions like this. Um, uh, um, I think in categories of uh, uh, Charles Dickens, uh, but he didn't write much American history or biography, so I have to add David McCullough, um, who has written eight or 10 great books, all of which are still in print. Uh, the first being on the Johnstown flood in 19, which was published in 1966, about an event that had happened in the 1880s and there were still survivors uh, in, uh, uh, who he interviewed. Um, and David McCullough, I always mention also as someone who gave me, not personally, but imparted some of the best advice I've ever gotten for speech writing. And that, that is uh, when um, he was asked about the variety of, of books he had written, and there's no clear theme to all of the books. Uh, and so the question was, how did he decide what his next book was going to be? And he said, I write the book I want to read. And uh, I, I remember that, that stuck in my mind. I thought, that's a good, that's a good attitude for a speechwriter. Write the speech you wouldn't mind listening to. <laughs> exactly. Um, I could go on, but there's two in different categories. I'm a fan of McCullough, too. His John Adams biography, it was just really amazing. It you sort of brought, literally brought history to life, like you were riding his horse with him. So I admire that, too. Um, but to this day, one of my favorite books of all time is To Kill a Mockingbird, and just the way it evoked um, a summer in the South. And then um, uh, Jhumpa Lahiri, um, because she really conveys what it's like to be a, you know, a child of immigrants and a woman. Um, and along those lines, um, I don't know how to say her name, but the, Chimananda, the woman who wrote Americana is really amazing. And Lin-Manuel Miranda, super cool, love him. So. You both mentioned instances of conflict with your principal or when your genius is unappreciated. Can both of you recall specific moments when you felt really strongly that, that you had written something that you thought was very important and you got disagreement from either a, a chief or a principal or somebody? What did you do in that situation? Did you push back? And when you say you were diplomatic, I mean, what is that like? How do you tell what's so important that you feel you have to advocate for it? And how do you tell when it's time to just let it go? So for me, I was thinking um, the speech he gave at Little Rock um, at uh, Central High School, I really wanted to start with this anecdote about Elizabeth Eckford, who was the woman, one of the Little Rock Nine, who showed up and didn't get the phone call that they were going to go in the back door. She showed up in the front door, and all these pro white protesters surrounded her. And there's the photo of the girl, you know, sort of like mean girl, sort of like, you know, there's that famous photo. I don't know if people know that. This um, African American you know, surrounded. So I really wanted to start with that. And there were people who thought that was not the right way to go. And um, some just thought it was a slow beginning or whatever. And so I was a little like, oh my God, this is brilliant. You can't do this. Um, and my boss was like, don't worry. You know, look at my pen. My pen's not moving. You know, I'm not correct. You know, and but there was, a, you know, it was almost on its way out. And then, um, and you know, Clinton was concerned about it, but in the end, he read it and decided to keep it. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, it's not your speech. And while you're powerful as a speechwriter, there are there are people who outrank you. Um, so I, um, but uh, so I, you know, I, I think I reacted a little too strongly. But I, I, um, I just I just hoped that the principal would see the value of it, and he did. Um, but it doesn't always go that way, and you just have to remember that it's it's not your speech. It's never your speech, and and they, you know, they're it's 
always going to be a true, you know, they take credit for it and they stand to lose if they do, you know, so, so you just have to let it go. And most of the time I could just let it go. Um, I, uh, in, the, the, in the drafting process of the speech to Congress after 9-11, the September 20th speech, uh, Karen Hughes, the president's counselor who came, uh, who worked with him uh, in Texas in his first campaign in the governor's office all through the campaign and into the White House, um, she advocated for the line, live your lives, uh, um, live your lives and hug your children about what is asked of us now after these attacks and looking, looking ahead to life in America. And, that, and I believe that was the line, live your lives and hug, hug your children. And um, I remember a couple colleagues and I, did, we, didn't, we didn't like that. And we tried several times to remove it from the speech. I think we may have even removed it from the speech at some point, but uh, it stayed in. And it was a line that touched a lot of people and is still remembered. And we, we were wrong about that. Um, that's one memory that comes to mind. I can't think of something that I really insisted, tried to insist to be kept and wasn't, although there was probably a joke along the way that we thought was funny. And <laughs> I, I, definitely that happened. Uh, <laughs> some jokes we amused ourselves with in the speech writing office, but didn't really resonate anywhere beyond the, the, uh, the door. <laughs> Um, hi, so I'm in the middle of Ben Rhodes' new book, um, The World As It Is, and he talks about having to kind of mind meld with President Obama. Um, he read his memoir, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm wondering if you ever worried that by trying to mind meld with um, your principal, you ever worried that you would lose your own writing voice? You know, I guess, you know, those five years, I probably didn't have much, my, much of my own voice. Um, but it comes back, you know, and, and, you know, there was no time to write for yourself you know, when you write in the White House. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't, maybe I did, like, you know, like Clinton liked to write, speak in lists, and maybe I write more in lists now first and second and finally. Um, yeah. But I didn't worry too bad. Yeah, I guess, uh, I guess I feel the same. Um, I, I will say that I felt as, as long as I was involved with George W. Bush, that made me a better writer uh, because, of, uh, because of how uh, careful he was as an editor and how logical he was as a thinker. I think, um, so I was never afraid of losing my own voice because I always, every day I was there, I felt like my, my tools as a writer were being sharpened just because of the, the demands of it. Yeah, I always wanted to like, I wanted to give my best to them. And I always wanted to like, you know, find the, the best, the most evocative image and the best words. And, and, you know, Clinton would say too many words, too many words. So wanted to be very economical. And I think that makes you a better writer. You know, none of this florid stuff, just like the best verbs, you know, fewer adjectives, the best nouns, you know, and, and, and the ways to be economical yet very evocative. And uh, yeah, that makes them, I think that definitely made me a better writer and um, very much more careful about word choice, so. So I, I, I was curious, uh, what advice would you have for a policy person to be a better communicator of policy? Uh, that's pretty good. Uh, yeah, go. Well, um, uh, Think first, the, the first question I always ask uh, about, a, about a speech assignment, aside from the obvious one, what's the speech about, is who is the audience? Because that has a, 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 a huge uh, influence on, on how you're <coughs> gonna be writing it. Uh, is your audience uh, a room full of NASA engineers? Or is it a graduating class of a college? Or is it uh, a group of political donors? I mean, you just go through the, the endless, uh, uh, endless variety. Um, and in terms of policy, I would say to become a clearer, more direct, more persuasive, and more economical policy writer, think really hard about an audience 
uh, perhaps an audience that's really not technically familiar with the material, um, but not unintelligent and not uninterested, but rather simply not, not conversant uh, in the matter. Um, uh, uh, I remember Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote a, a series of very interesting books about uh, the Supreme Court and history. And in the introduction to one of them, he said that he, when he was writing, he, he thought constantly of his wife, who was educated at Stanford like he was, but was not a lawyer. But these books were about law and about the court. And he said that having his wife, an, an, an interested, intelligent reader in mind, but not a technically trained reader, uh, 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 was, was a great advantage to, uh, to the final product. So whether it's thinking of one person uh, or, or of, a, of, a larger, of a larger audience of, of a type of person, I promise you um, what you write tomorrow will be better than you write today if you sort of put it in those terms. I, I know this from experience. Yeah, and also keeping in mind um, what the policy means for real people. So painting that picture of what, what's the, the human result of this policy. Um, I think, you know, sometimes because we had to turn things over really quickly, you end up, you get the fact sheet and you end up like, if you get really tired or lazy, you're like, you're just rewriting the fact sheet you know, trying to elevate a little, but really you should stop, write the fact sheet, and then figure out what this means as, you know, to just to build on what, um, like, what, what is the human impact, and, you know, what does this mean for an average family of four, you know, like this person in Ohio, you know, how is his life transformed by this policy, um, and, and keep that in mind, and then paint that picture, and that, that will really sort of communicate to a broader audience what, what a policy means. Thank you for a very interesting discussion. Uh, my question relates to the relative lack of media exposure of presidential speechwriters in the last decade or more, in contrast to the 80s and 90s when you had people like William Sapphire, uh, who was reputed for the famous words negative, nabobs of, negativis, uh, or nabobs of negativism, in the words of uh, put in the speech of Spiro Agnew. So my question is, is it because people assume that in the case of articulate and uh, erudite presidents like Bill Clinton and uh, Barack Obama, as she correctly mentioned, who write, uh, speak beautifully, and they assume that, well, every speech is, is their own speech. Uh, whereas in the case of less articulate people like Nixon and Spiro Agnew, uh, people say, oh, well, that can't be his words. So we'll have to find out. And my other question is, for a presidential speechwriter, is it more difficult to work with an articulate president who might nitpick and torture them to hell with producing draft after draft, or with uh, less articulate presidents who will take the speechwriter's speech uh, hook, line, and sinker? Well, I disagree. I think there are a lot of famous speechwriters. Like, the whole Obama team is famous. Like, everyone knows, you know, John Favreau. I mean, not everyone, but. They've gotten plenty of credit and coverage from the media. Um, you know, everyone. I'm, you know, so I, I don't think, and and it's, um, you know, and they've gotten their fair share of credit too. I would say. Um, so I don't know about that. I mean, maybe there, and and maybe there are more outlets now because they're all over there in podcasts. You know, like Sapphire had that column, but now there are many more ways to get your voice out and to claim credit and to be famous, I guess. Does everyone here know that Chris Matthews was a presidential speechwriter? And he wrote for President Carter. And um, uh, I'm thinking of a few, you mentioned Bill Sapphire, who I knew uh, was, a, was, a, was a fine guy and, and was an, uh, a presidential speechwriter for Nixon and also did some uh, very effective speeches for Vice President Agnew. Another person on that staff was Pat Buchanan <laughs> and um, he had been with Nixon before he was president, and uh, he had been, Nixon uh, himself hired Buchanan based on reputation uh, sometime in the, in the, in the mid-60s when he was still getting ready uh, to, to run again for president in 68. And, and I've heard Buchanan tell the story that, uh, 
Nixon, who worked very, very hard on his speeches, probably harder than, as, as hard or harder than most of his uh, successors uh, since then, um, uh, <laughs> that uh, Nixon, he remembers Nixon saying, why can't I get speech writers like Woodrow Wilson? And they said, well, Mr. President, Woodrow Wilson wrote his own speeches. <laughs> Um, could each of you share a few anecdotes about um, mistakes or screw-ups that you either made or witnessed in the White House? Yeah, I'll jump. To, <laughs> I'll jump to that one. <clears throat> uh, the uh, we were very proud of uh, our fact-checking operation in the speechwriting office. The fact-checking operation uh, was 100% successful, but shortly before we had an up and running fact-checking operation, uh, I remember there was uh, a reference to Pope John Paul uh, uh, leading a flock of a trillion. Well, there, there aren't a trillion people on Earth or anywhere close to it. It was a billion. <laughs> but it was during the budget season, I remember, everyone was throwing around trillions. Tr everything was in trillions. And so we wrote this speech. And, and about Pope John Paul, it was about his whole life. It was uh, at the dedication of the John Paul II Cultural Center here in Washington. And um, the speech went through, the speech writer, multiple drafts, the staffing process, and um, it wasn't caught until surprisingly late in the game when somebody said, do you mean billion? <laughs> 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 but that never, um, that, that was, uh, that was where the uh, quality control process uh, came in to correct things before, uh, before the president was involved. Yeah, I was super paranoid about making a mistake. And so it was almost OCD, like, you know, just triple checking everything and like having other people check it and harassing the policy people to check things and, you know, just never wanting to send out something incorrect or off by a zero or anything like that. So it was a very very nerve-wracking um, part of the job, right? Because you just thought, oh, I'm going to get fired if I get something wrong, you know? So, um, so I can't, you know, and this is self-serving, but I can't think of, like, a major mistake. Maybe they were and just never filtered another. back. But I do have a good story. <laughs> what? No, I have a good story. And this is my naivete, because I was young and really new to Washington ways and ranks and titles and all these, you know, there are all these titles and a deputy outranks an assistant and all this stuff. So um, I was on the plane um, coming back from England with Hillary and um, she was giving a lift to this guy, Larry Summers. And, um, <laughs> and um, I, you know, I'd gone, I'd gone to college and Larry Summers, uh, I went to Harvard and Larry Summers was a professor at Harvard. So I'm like, hey, Professor Summers, good to see you. Um, um, how are you doing? I read your, uh, whatever, I read your articles in, in Ec-10, and they were great. Um, what are you doing now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, I said, you're at Treasury, right? And he said, I'm the Deputy Secretary. And I'm like, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I got home, and I talked to my boss, and I'm like, I met Larry Summers, you know, he's, he, you know, he's like, and I, you know, I, he's something like the Deputy Secretary. He's like, oh, my God. Do you know what the Deputy Secretary is? I'm like, oh, no. He's like, that's the number two in the department. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, I didn't even like get that I was insulting him, you know, because I had no idea that a deputy secretary was like number two. So anyway, that's a I, well, at one point, that's embarrassing. I, at one point, I was reading a, a best-selling book, uh, and it had a very interesting little story in it that was ir irresistible. It was about John Philip Sousa, the composer, that his family name was not Sousa; it was So S O. And that, out of love for the United States, he literally added USA to his last name. Well, it, it never happened. It wasn't true. It wasn't true. Um, and, uh, and, but it was in a best-selling book. And, and uh, you know, we dropped it in a, a speech draft. And, and the first person who sees the speech draft is the fact checker who goes to check the fact. And this, this best-selling book notwithstanding, there was no truth to this story. Anyway. Yeah, I think I, now that's bringing up something. Yeah, like you have to like five, five million check something and, right. 
and right. sometimes it's still I'm right. Yeah, I and can, I remember one remember, one historian I'm sure we did that too. One historian I talked to once he I, I I told him you know every now and then I read something in a in a book or a biography and and I just wonder if it really was that way. And he said, well, you know, as we say in the in the in the history profession, some stories are too good to check. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or it's like if you can't get that triple check, you're like, oh, I'm gonna have to kill this, you know, and you just don't want to kill it. But last quick question for me. Uh, a lot of people around here are looking to jump into speech writing. And I think the opportunity is now quite interesting. If you look on the Democratic side, 2020, you've got young congressmen and women that are looking to jump in. It's kind of open game. Should somebody move out to Iowa? Should somebody go work for this congressman? Should somebody work for the Labor Department? Should somebody work for in a governor's office, take that jump and move to Colorado? In order to really break in and to have an effective impact in what you believe that you're able to offer, what type of individual would you suggest really going and trying to break in with and gain the confidence with? What, what kind of person should do what it? Kind of, what, what, what kind of person would you, what kind of principal would you be looking for? Would you recommend starting as a fact checker in an office? Would you recommend starting and working with a younger principal? What would you be kind of a route in this day and age that we're looking at now? Find someone you really like. And if you can't get a job as a writer for that person, go to work for that person anyway. If you really want, if you really like this person and you really want to write for this person and you can write, I can, I can almost guarantee that if you get onto that staff and they find out that you're a writer and that you're able to do this and that you can do it under the conditions of a campaign or whatever, whatever other uh, 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 intense or demanding conditions they have, they will use you. Maybe you're, maybe you're on the finance staff, maybe you're on the clerical staff, administrative team, um, uh, fact check, research, whatever, uh, press. And if you just say, well, how about, I, I would like to just, when you have a spare project, a press release, a policy paper or something, I'd like, to, I'd like to take a crack at that if you wouldn't mind. I don't think they're gonna say no to you. And if you're really good, they will come back and back and back, and there will be no limit uh, to how, f how far you can, can rise in that operation if you can meet that standard. That's exactly, it's exactly what I was gonna say. Like, um, in a campaign, there are battlefield promotions, and really, the talent rises. You know, no other situation, the other situation's kind of murky, but in a campaign, it's like all hands on deck, and the, the best people need to, will rise, and will we'll, we'll get opportunities. Also, there are not a lot of good writers out there. So if you can write, it's, it's like a needle in a haystack, especially on a campaign. There's so many operatives and, and you know, vision, people with whatever ideas, but very few people can write. So if you can do that and you go in at any level, any job, and volunteer yourself, and once they figure out you can write, you know, th there's so m there are so many things that need to be written in a campaign, not just the speeches, but all kinds of texts and answers and questionnaires. All those things, they need good writers. And once you're identified, they will, they'll keep coming. Um, and you'll get great jobs. And, and back to that thing, like, and you're only, you, so you're gonna take a small, low-level job, and the only way to stay, and for no money, or little money, the only way to stay happy is to believe in the candidate and really, like, think they're the best thing for America. So you should find someone you like and think should be in the job. And, and, and then, it, then it becomes much more easy. It's like a mission. You're, you're on a mission. And, 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 and we both know people who've made that very decision, and in many cases, maybe a majority, it's a snap decision. That's my person. Yeah, yeah, you fall so in love, right? Trust, yeah, trust your instincts and, as well. And, um, and getting coffee is not beneath you. You know, like, do everything, be a yes person, you know, like, just make copies, you know, get the coffee, and then say, oh, and if you have any, if you're overloaded with talking points, I'd like to try a few. Let me try a few. So. I remember Ari Fleischer, I think it was, said, the good interns always go and make the copies. The great, exactly. The great interns read the things they're copying. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's, but there are so many young people I've run across who are like, oh no, I want to do substantive things. No, 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 you've got to do the copies too, you know, and, and then you'll get into the substantive things. Look for the opportunities to do something, but do the copies. John June, thank you guys very much.
Thank you, everybody, for joining. There's a little reception. You can join us. Thank you, guys.